Hello everybody, welcome to Red Toolhouse. Uh, so it should be no surprise to most of us that we're still seeing supply chain issues throughout every source due to the recent pandemic. We're seeing that show up in grocery stores with uh, just lack of options and shortages. Who would have thought a global pandemic would make it so difficult to find manicotti shells recently? Is what it is, right? There's another issue, however, that I think is going to affect food supply and food access for the next year or more. And that is the drought that we're seeing in the Midwest and in the West. So let's talk about that for a second. So it seems kind of odd to me to talk about drought standing in the tropical rainforest that is our farm right now. All the rain that the Midwest should be getting, we've gotten in spades. But before I go any further, I don't want this video to be a fear-mongering video. I don't, I don't believe we're created to live in a state of fear. I do, however, want to encourage wisdom and prudence at this time, especially when we're talking about supply chain issues. Please don't assume that our national food supply is bulletproof. Don't assume that you can always get the food that you need by simply exchanging dollars with somebody else or some other uh, business or organization. I believe now is the time to take even more personal responsibility when it comes to our own food. So if you've watched the news or looked at headlines lately, you've probably seen a lot of mentions about this mega drought that's going on in the West. You know, the California, Arizona, New Mexico area there, uh, Colorado, all that is, is, is dealing with tons and tons of drought issues. Um, Colorado River's drying up, Lake Mead, all of that is, is, is being reported all through the news. What you don't see a lot of discussion, however, is what's going on in the Midwest when it comes to drought. Supposedly, the Midwest is its second year of drought conditions, and we're seeing that show up, especially in livestock production right now. So one area I want to focus on in particular in this video is beef production. And according to Beef Magazine and other publications I referenced to be able to research the details for this video, Due to the drought, we're seeing a lot of pasture land, a lot of grazing area, not produce the grass this time of year that it needs to for beef to be grazing properly. Due to that, a lot of these ranchers and farmers are selling off their cattle in bulk. They're, they're getting rid of more than they ever would this time of year because they cannot sustain the animal on their pasture. The only option would be to feed grain or to feed hay. And of course, that's a whole bunch of extra expense that a rancher or farmer is not expecting to take on. If you want to understand the depth of that, uh, just Google that. Google uh, beef sell-off due to drought, uh, or look on YouTube for that, and you'll see these reports of these ranchers. There, there's uh, lines miles long at these livestock auctions as these ranchers are lining up with their livestock trailers, with their beef, trying to get rid of it. Um, because they just can't afford to sustain it on the dry land they have. So you may be asking, okay, Troy, where's the wisdom and prudence come in? Because right now you're just kind of fear-mongering. Well, if you've watched this channel, or you're familiar at all with this channel, you know we really focus on homesteading, more sustainable living, um, self-reliance type issues there. That's what we cover. So I see this as an opportunity. Now, here's total speculation. So as the market gets flooded with beef, as with anything, this is basic economics, as more beef comes in, what should that do? That should cause there to be a flood of beef available, which should lower the price. Now, should is the big, big question mark here, simply because there's so many other things that affect the beef market. Subsidies and all those other things that come into play as well. But let's say the market drops, let's say it doesn't drop. If the market drops, it makes us even more of an opportunity. But if it doesn't, this is still something I think we all need to look at. With a flood of beef, even if the prices stand firm or they drop a little bit or they drop drastically, there's going to be an opportunity to buy beef cheap, right? Well, what's going to happen on the tail end of that? Because it takes almost two years for a beef to come to um, age of slaughter, there's going to be a dip. So the demand, so you go from a flooded market to a market, market where there's high demand and low supply, and that's going to put beef prices up really, really high. And the big question is, how high are we going to see that? Is it going to be super high prices? Or are we actually dealing with scarcity at this point? 
Are we going to run out of beef or there's going to be uh, inability to access beef unless you're really ready to spend a lot per pound? So at this time, if you have the means to bulk store beef in your house, your freezer, whatever the case may be, now would be the time to look at stocking up if you haven't already. If you're not prepared to bulk store anything, maybe it's the time to make that investment in freezers, pressure canners, dehydrators, whatever the case may be. It may be time to look into that. Now, ideally, I recommend looking for a local beef producer, a local farmer in your area. While the market's not necessarily going to affect their beef prices and drop them dramatically, buying bulk, so buying a whole or a half or even a quarter from a local farmer is probably going to give you just as much buying power, say, if you went to the supermarket, even if the supermarket was discounting beef greatly, you're still buying individual cuts. So you can probably still save money, but you're also going to be able to support these farmers uh, that are obviously trying to trying to provide for their family, trying to keep their farm operational. So look for a local producer and talk to them about buying halves or holes. So how does that even affect? Is if the market if if a local farmer is insulated from this market, then why is this a big push from that degree? Well, I know from experience that we're going to see the increase of hay and feed prices go up later, and we'll get into that more here in a second. So this drought is going to affect all of us, even those in water-rich Appalachia. It's going to show up sooner or later. So what I'm suggesting is going to obviously require a, a decent outlay of cash. So whether you already have freezers and you've got capacity and you're just buying the beef, then that's going to be a large outlay. Uh, if you don't have your freezers and you got to go buy those, then that's an issue as well. But I think now's the time to invest in those if you haven't already. If that's too much money to, to take on at one time, maybe talk to a neighbor or friend to say, hey, would you like to split the cost of a beef? Or maybe even the split the cost of the freezer. We'll have the freezer here in our house and we'll get a half beef or we'll get a whole beef and we'll split that and we'll know that half and half situation. Whatever you can work out there that's trusted and reliable may be an option to help offset those costs. You may be saying also, well, I really don't have the room for any more freezers, or the only freezer I have is the one over top of my refrigerator, and I just don't have the room to put a chest freezer in anywhere. Well, again, this is your call, but I would say, looking at these type of things, this may be a time to make logical sacrifices. If it's two-car garage situation and both cars are in the garage, maybe a car stays outside for a while, so you can put a chest freezer or two in there to provide um, storage for food. You know, to me in this situation, more food supply for my family would be more important than the finish on my car over the next 12 months. So I would definitely make that swap. Keep in mind, there's also other options for storing beef or protein uh, other than freezing. Of course, you can dehydrate, you can make jerky. A lot of people I know can beef, uh, they can all their protein, can the deer that they hunt. There's definitely an option there. And even freeze drying options. I've never messed with freeze drying, but I know that is an option as well. Now, before you take on any of these uh, processes, if, you, if you're not familiar with them at all, then you need to get familiar with them before you go out and spend all this money on a whole beef and think you know how to dehydrate it or you know how to can it properly. Test some of that first before you get into it and make sure, especially with canning, make sure you understand and follow the guidelines when it comes to canning beef. Another option, of course, would just be to simply stop eating beef in the next 12 months or 14 months or 18 months or whatever we're going to see effect here because of the drought. That is clearly an option. And you can say, well, I eat more chicken and, and maybe I eat more pork anyway. Well, as a pork farmer, I say, yay. But as I mentioned earlier, this drought is going to show up in all of these markets eventually. So if the drought in our bread basket where you have the United States, where we get all of our grain or most of our grain production is going to be affecting not only grazing lands, but, um, but agriculture lands where these grains are growing, then the price of grain could possibly go up. Um, I'm seeing it already and the cost of my pork and chicken feed. So as those costs go up, of course, we farmers have to pass that expense on to the consumer. So chicken and pork are also going to go up in price. So what I'm talking about with storing beef could also apply with storing chicken and pork and any other protein. Now, I'm no ag economist, and I know the global market's going to affect a lot of this stuff. In fact, 
My fear is that our government is going to be here to help us, and they're going to say, hey, we need to loosen restrictions on imported beef because these other countries weren't dealing with a drought, and they can bring their beef in. So if we reduce restrictions and we can flood the market or we can get the, uh, the capacity back up to what people are expecting, then there's not going to be a dip in beef. And while the government thinks they're helping us all out, they're actually uh, kind of putting the death nail in the coffin of, uh, of most small farms and ranches if they do that. So we'll just have to see how that goes. Same with grain as well. Uh, as the Ukrainian embargoes get lifted and grain starts to come back in, how will that global market affect grain prices when it comes to animal feed? So not to sound doom and gloom, I don't think this is a sky is falling type situation. I think, and again, I want to emphasize think, that we're not going to see the 1930 style bread lines. We're not going into a Great Depression. I think what we're going to see is just a simple dip in supply chain. We're going to have issues accessing specific beef, beef cuts, uh, beef choice. We may see prices go up to the point that it maybe starts to rub against your monthly household budget, that this just doesn't make sense. We're going to have to cut out or, or not consume any of this product. So that's why I think right now, if you stockpile, if you can store up maybe a year's supply worth of beef and chicken and pork, whatever it may be, then we may be able to ride this out and it not affect us negatively to the point where it's affecting our budget or making us dip into savings resources to be able to provide the food we're used to. So I think it's just prudent right now to look at that and say, well, let's try to load up so we can cover the gap that's coming and better days are, will be ahead as soon as this gap levels out. I do hope for all of us that this situation is a very obvious reminder or an obvious illustration of just how weak our global food system is. That when we rely weekly on transportation to bring food from all over the world to a location that we can go throw down some cash and get it and it's all packaged neatly and all that, then, then we're really taking a big risk in being able to provide for ourselves and our family. So I hope this is an opportunity for all of us to kind of stop and say, hmm, this may not be something to totally rely on for the rest of our lives. This may be something that these chinks in the armor that we're seeing show up could possibly get worse on down the road. So hopefully this encourages us to be more self-reliant no matter where we are, whether we're on a big homestead or whether we're in a small suburban area. So what I'm suggesting obviously isn't just applicable to protein. At the time of recording this, the summer of 2022, of course we're in the beginning arc of harvest season for Northern Hemisphere, of course. So this could apply to not only protein, beef, chicken, pork, lamb, those type of things, but to all the veg. So if you have your own garden, you know this. You're producing tons of tomatoes, zucchini, squash, whatever the case may be. So now's the time to squirrel all that away. You may have a neighbor whose garden is prolific and they're constantly trying to push zucchini off on you. I suggest taking some of that, figuring out how to store it up and save it for the winter months. You may be suggesting, hey, Troy, why don't you cut your grass? And to my answer is, if it would ever stop raining, then maybe we could get that cut. Another way to look at this, if you don't even have a garden or maybe you don't have a neighbor that's got a garden, look for your local farmer's market. Let's get the weeds out of the way here. Look for a local farmer's market that now they should have a lot of their harvest ready. I think in a situation like my mom, my mom and dad, they're up in their upper 70s, so mom doesn't do a big garden like she used to. But they really like fresh corn, so she'll go to a farmer's market, she'll buy several bushels of corn very, very inexpensively, bring those home, cut them off the cob, and, and prepare them for freezing. And she'll freeze a year's worth of corn just in one weekend simply by going to the farmer's market. So not only is she getting a great deal on corn, she's putting a little bit of work to store up a year's supply of that, but she's also supporting a local farmer in the process. So look at those type of options. Read up on how to store some of this stuff. And if you go to farmer's markets, Depending on what they have, if there's a bumper crop of something, talk to them about bulk pricing. If they say, hey, we sell, you know, three tomatoes for a dollar or we sell a bushel for X, whatever the case may be, ask them, what's five bushels? What's 10 bushels? What's 50 pounds of this product? What can you give me a bulk price on? 
And a lot of those farmers will take full advantage of that because some of their product is going to spoil before it gets sold anyway. So they're going to take a discount on that and still be able to make money. So I'll even give you a, a tip that we like to do, and Kelly's done this for a couple years now, and that uh, when it comes to a bulk of tomatoes, you know, a lot of people like to take tomatoes, make your sauce, you can that, uh, you dice them up, do whatever you can, and put them in cans. Well, we freeze some as well. And what you can do is simply take them straight off the vine and freeze them. Don't wash them, don't anything, just put them straight in the freezer. And when you need them, you just simply take them out. And as you defrost them, as you run them water over them or whatever the case may be, the skins just fall off. So if Kelly has a recipe where she needs maybe one or two tomatoes, then she simply comes to the freezer, grabs a couple out of the bags and starts to thaw them out that way. Works out great and keeps us from you know, having to crack open a jar or something that's gonna last even longer. So another thing you can do, if you've got a vacuum sealer, you, know, you you think of vacuum and sealing stuff that you're going to put in the freezer, but you can also dry vacuum seal a lot of things, uh, like flour and grains and those type of things, and you get a much longer shelf life out of that versus if you just had it in a uh, container in the container it comes in. You know, there are so many ways to store food for your family, whether it's dehydrating, whether it's canning, whether it's vacuum sealing or freezing. You've got a whole bunch of options, and right now, this summer, is the time to try to put away as much of that as possible and also take advantage of supplies that are in stock right now check with local farmers see what they have see what you can buy in bulk and see what deals you can get you know now is the time to put away a harvest for a long winter that could come and now is the time to take more responsibility for your own food well comment below and let me know what you guys do to stockpile food maybe what type of food you keep particularly, how you rotate through so your food doesn't get too old over time. Let me know what you've got going on. Appreciate everybody watching. Take care.